Welcome to this uh, lecture, The Introduction to Gardener's Art Through the Ages, A Concise Global History, Chapter 9, High Renaissance and Mannerism in Europe. And uh, this is a lecture by me, Julia Schlosser. All right, so first we're going to look at a map of Europe in the early 16th century. And um, you can see that it looks a little bit different than the map that we see today. We've got the prominence of the Holy Roman Empire and um, France. Most of the work that we're going to look at is going to come from um, what we think of as Italy, so uh, Rome and Florence, um, but you can also see Spain and uh, England. And uh, here is the section of the globe that's represented in this map. All right, the art and architecture of 16th century Italy built on the foundation of the early Renaissance of the 15th century, but no single artistic style characterized what we call Cinquecento art. Regional differences abounded, especially between central Italy, Florence and Rome, and Venice. The period opened with a brief era that art historians call the High Renaissance. So, um, this is a short period of time, a quarter century, so about 25 years, and that this is between the time of 1495 and about 1520. Um, Leonardo da Vinci dies in 1519 and Raphael dies in 1520. And so I just, just think about what a short period of time, 25 years, but we still look back to this time as one of the most prolific um, in art historical um, you know, time. Uh, the Renaissance style and interest in classical culture, perspective, proportion, and human anatomy dominated the remainder of the 16th century, which we call the late Renaissance, but a new style called mannerism challenged Renaissance naturalism almost as soon as Raphael had been laid to rest um, inside the ancient Roman pantheon. And we're going to see that the Renaissance artists were very interested in um, ancient Greek art. So um, it's good for us to skip for, you know, from ancient Greek to Renaissance and um, we're going to see this new interest in looking back at that artwork and we'll see how much it influences um, Michelangelo and these different artists. The one constant in 16th century Italy is the astounding quality, both technical and aesthetic, of the art and architecture produced. Indeed, the modern notion of the fine arts and the celebration of artistic genius originated in Renaissance Italy. So kind of the way we value art and um, how we still really value um, what we think of are the, as these genius artists. During the high Renaissance, artists became international celebrities for the first time and none achieved greater fame than Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo although even they could not create artworks freely but had to satisfy the demands of their patrons. And so we're going to see that during this period of time, during the Renaissance, artists were very valued. Um, and artists who achieved this kind of celebrity status um, were paid you know, money. They negotiated to get even more money. Um, we're going to see that they travel around, so they would, you know, write letters and uh, look for new commissions, look for new people to pay them, um, and then they would go and create these artworks. But remember that they're creating an artwork for a patron, somebody who's paying them. So they could not just make whatever they wanted. They had to make. They had to negotiate with the patron to. Um, for, for what the patron wanted, and then the artist obviously would try to get, um, you know, what they wanted to work on as part of it, right? But again, so while the artists were supported, they still were producing artwork for um, someone specific, a patron who was paying them. All right, and then you can see that this is a, the map of Renaissance uh, Europe uh, with a uh, by religion. 16th century Europe remained largely Roman Catholic, except in Switzerland and the far north where the impact of the Protestant Reformation was, was strongest. So we're going to see that um, start, we start out with Catholicism being very important, but then uh, various people um, 
become very tired of the practices of the Catholic Church. And uh, someone like Martin Luther is going to write and uh, uh, you know against the Catholic Church. And as as people started leaving the Catholic Church to go to these new Protestant churches, the Catholics got worried that they were losing people, um, and so they instituted the Counter Reformation. Um, and we'll again see artwork being used by um, the the Counter Reformation to strengthen their um, ideologies. All right, dates and places. Um, so we're looking at roughly 1500 to 1600. And we're looking at Rome, Florence, Milan, and Venice. And um, humanism is a very important idea. And again, this comes from this rediscovery, so-called rediscovery of um, these uh, works by Greek philosophers and artists. And um, we're going to see the tension between, so first the Catholic Church has all the power. And then people start to rebel against the practices that they consider to be immoral of the Catholic Church. And they was started to split off into Protestant um, churches. And then the Catholics realized, hey, we're losing folks, we're losing power. And so they started to institute uh, the Counter-Reformation um, with the help of the Jesuits. And um, the and all of these, the Catholic Church, the Protestants, and the, the Catholic Church under the Counter-Reformation, all used artwork by these very famous artists to um, influence people, to, um, to convey to people what their views were. And so they're all using artwork as propaganda of one sort or another. Um, all right. They had very powerful courts, so um, the power would be um, concentrated in these courts with a you know a, somebody in control and these courts also wanted their point of view to be represented so they would hire these artists to represent their point of view and um, and display these very large artworks for the, the people um, in their uh, under their control to to reinforce their power um, and this is the the time when the artist genius um, that we still, you know, uh, somebody today like David Hockney, we consider him to be kind of an artist genius, right? <clears throat> Maybe Banksy. Um, excuse me just a sec. Uh, so, and again, this starts um, in Italy. Uh, themes, the life of Christ and the Virgin Mary, <clears throat> the lives of the saints, uh, portraiture. <coughs> excuse me. So today, um, you know, all we have to do is take out our phone put it on our, uh, you know, <laughs> selfie camera, take a portrait, upload it to the internet. Two minutes later, uh, you know, we, we've got a portrait on the internet. But think about it. Back then, there was no photography. Um, the only way to have, to even see yourself was to look maybe in the reflection in water or in a mirror or a window. But those weren't very, um, you know, there weren't very many of those for most people. And so if you were powerful enough, rich enough to have a portrait painted, this really conveys a sense of importance, right? Wow, you must be an important person because I can see your portrait here. And we're going to see how Leonardo develops this um, idea of the psychological portrait. Um, mythology. So I mentioned that <clears throat> um, there was this renewed interest in um, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy and art. And so artists were thinking about mythology. They were thinking about antiquity um, as settings for their paintings. Um, allegory and um, this idea of painting in a very poetic manner um, becomes important. The forms Balance, harmony, ideal beauty. Oh, what does this remind us of? Well, the ancient Greeks, right? The idea of contrapposto, the, the way the body moves in space, the way you can um, uh, picture somebody, um, you know, in the very balanced composition. So all of these are ideas that are very important uh, during the High Renaissance. Um, in Venice, the artists were really interested in color and then this mannerist distortion. So it's kind of like the pendulum goes back and forth, right? Um, the, the artists in the High Renaissance kind of perfected this very balanced um, uh, compositions. And then uh, the artists that came after them said, eh, 
that's that's boring, right? That's my parents' generation. I'm going to do something different. And they started to di to distort the, the body in this um, kind of mannerist style. Uh, all right, so here's a preview of the high renaissance and mannerism in Europe. Italian art in the 16th century built upon the foundation of the early renaissance, particularly in the interest in classical culture, so Greek and Roman culture. Perspective, we're going to see this interest in linear perspective. Um, we, we know, you know, we, we look out onto the world, we see the, the three-dimensional world. How can we, um, how can we uh, represent that on a two-dimensional plane? So the idea of linear perspective and human anatomy, um, all very important, but it developed in dis dramatic and distinctive ways. And here are our, our big three, right? Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo were the leading figures during the Renaissance. So, and this is an era in which artists were celebrated and recognized for their individual achievements. So we start to know who's painting what, they sign it. Uh, Titian was the great master of Venetian painting. And Palladio and Bramante, we're going to talk about Bramante, were the leading architects of the Renaissance. So architecture becomes incredibly important. During this period, the Catholic Church remained the central patron of the arts. The Catholic Church is hiring artists to uh, make this artwork that fills their churches and their, uh, you know, their outdoor uh, um, uh, courtyards um, so that people could see and uh, get ideas about what the, the Catholic Church wanted to convey through this artwork. And one of the most important patrons, remember that word, patron, um, Pope Julius II was responsible for commissioning some of the greatest Renaissance artwork. So if you're like me and you want to um, go to Italy and see all this amazing artwork, um, uh, you know, like as a bucket list thing, a lot of those bucket list uh, works are probably going to be some that were commissioned by Pope Julius II. Um, so good for artists, right, to have these commissions, but also kind of kept them on a leash because they had to paint or they had to negotiate to paint what they wanted and they had to please their patron at the same time. Artists were also recruited by the church to contribute their talents toward its counter-reformation efforts. So when the counter-reformation uh, went into effect and the Catholic Church said, okay, we're changing up some of our practices that people found so um, so immoral, um, then artists were painted, were commissioned to paint um, these new values, right, that the Catholic Church is espousing. Um, so again, it's all um, a matter of propaganda, right, uh, conveying ideas that you want people to understand from your artwork. Um, mannerism in Italy developed after 1520 as a reaction to the art of the High Renaissance. Uh, in Northern Europe, the 16th century saw profound political and cultural shifts that are reflected in the art of the period. Early in the century, the Reformation movement. Okay, so again, these are uh, people who are protesting against the, the Catholics. Um, they sparked lasting religious conflict throughout large areas of Northern Europe, and artists developed new expressions of Protestant ideals. Despite the, the Reformation's criticism of Catholicism, European states maintained active cultural exchange with Italy and absorbed the ideals of Italian Renaissance humanism. So, you know, who doesn't love Michelangelo, right? Even if, <laughs> even if people are mad at the Catholic Church, they still loved uh, that artwork. In the Holy Ro Roman Empire, the uh, painter and printmaker Albrecht Durer became the first inter international celebrity artist outside of Italy. And Netherlands painters were known for their inventive, often enigmatic forms and narratives best exemplified by the works of the country's leading painter, Hieronymus Bosch. Um, El Greco was a leading painter of the 16th century Spain, cultivating a style that combined Spanish religious fervor and the exaggerated forms of Italian mannerism. So he starts to stretch out his figures in these very kind of long, um, skinny figures that are very iconic to him. All right, High Renaissance Italy during the High. So the High Renaissance is 1500 to 1520, and the Late Renaissance, 1520 to 1600. Um, the major Italian artistic centers were Florence, Rome, and Venice. Whereas most Florentine and Roman artists 
emphasize careful design preparation based on preliminary drawings. So this idea of diseño, um, we'll talk about drawings um, in part two. Venetian artists focused on color and the process of paint application and took this very poetic approach to painting. All right, and uh, so we're gonna, here's an example from Leonardo da Vinci. He was a master of chiaroscuro and atmospheric perspective. And he was famous for his sfumato. So this is this misty haziness and for his psychological insight into depicting a biblical narrative. And then we'll go to Raphael. Raphael figured, um, favored lighter tonalities than Leonardo and clarity over obscurity. And his statuesque figures appear in landscapes under blue skies or in grandiose architectural settings rendered in perfect perspective. So you can see that um, this is an enormous fresco, 19 feet long, uh, feet high by 27 feet long. And um, this is in the Stanza della Signatura in the Apostolic Palace. So this is a palace in Vatican City. This is in Rome. And this entire wall is taken up by this painting. And this is really this idea of a window on the wall. Uh, sorry, a window on the world. Um, so we know that we could come up and we wouldn't actually touch it. But if we touch this, this would be a two-dimensional surface, right? It would be a solid two-dimensional surface. But what Raphael does is he uses linear perspective to create this illusion of space going back into this large architectural space, this large room, which uh, with all these statues right on the walls and all these men standing around on these stairs. And then in the very back, you can see the illusion of the sky. And so the way that these Renaissance artists are doing this is by using linear perspective and a vanishing point and everything converges. And the idea is if you were to stand in front of this painting in the actual space in one perfect place, you would have the best um, perfect spot for linear perspective. All the lines would converge and this would appear as if you were looking out into the three-dimensional world even though we know that we're looking at a two-dimensional surface. Um, and I just wanted to point out, look at how clear um, and bright these colors are and look at how blue the sky is. This is Raphael painting, but if we go back to um, Leonardo. Look at the sky. Do you see almost any blue at all in the sky, right? Here's a river and the even the water in the river appears very uh, sort of brown. It has very little use of blue. And so Leonardo was famous for this sfumato, this kind of haziness. Um, it, it, it's, it's almost smoky, his, his landscapes, right? And if you compare that, one way to tell him um, apart from Raphael is if you compare the kind of haziness and the smokiness of this landscape, and then we go back to Raphael, look at how clean and bright his colors are and look at how blue that sky is. So you can see that one of the things that happened in the Renaissance is that these artists developed very signature styles so that we could tell them apart and we could immediately know, oh, this is a Raphael. No, this is a Leonardo, right? So that's uh, one thing that happens. And then uh, lastly, we'll t um, talk about Michelangelo. And again, this is a marble statue, 17 feet high, uh, a figure, a biblical figure from the Old Testament, David. And in both painting and sculpture, Michelangelo won renown for his emotionally charged figures with heroic physique. So again, there's this kind of sense of the perfect man, right? He, and he preferred pent up energy. So this is this moment before David is going to throw um, the stone, right? So he has all this energy. And then Raphael, his figures are more calm and sort of solid in the space. All right, so the leading um, early uh, Cinquecento um, Italian architect was Bramante, who championed the classical style of the ancients. So again, looking back to the Greeks and seeing their architectural style, and then that influenced his style. And he was very interested in this central plan for churches. So a way to construct a church with a, a, a central plan. And this is really 
for most of us, I think, still how we are used to seeing churches today. In El Gesu, um, uh, Giacomo della Porta introduced this widely influential plan for basilican churches. So this is this broad nave and side chapels instead of aisles. And the two greatest masters of the Venetian painting school were Giorgione, who was a pioneer of poetical painting, and Titian, who was famed for his rich surface textures and dazzling display of color in all its nuances. And mannerism from 1520 to 1600 was a reaction against the High Renaissance style. And mannerist paintings by Potormo and uh, Parmigiano uh, Parmigianino, sorry, I always get that name wrong, uh, feature elongated figures, ambiguous space, and intentional departure from expected conventions. And the leading mannerist architecture, architect was Romano, whose designs represent a parody of Bramante's classical style. So you can see that these artists are all influencing each other, reacting against each other. Uh, all right, and so uh, that will end uh, part one of our lecture and uh, thanks for listening.